Um, lately there's been several developments on, uh, there are various conjectures about if you look at a graph that doesn't have holes of specific lengths. A hole means an induced subgraph, which is a cycle. There have been various developments that say if you look at graphs that don't contain holes of specific lengths, then you can bound the chromatic number or control the chromatic number. And Maria talked about some of them in, on, on Tuesday morning. Uh, I wanted to do some more. In particular, there's a conjecture of uh, Jarfesh that uh, if you look at graphs with no odd holes, hole means an induced cycle of length at least four. Triangles don't count, because I want the clique number to be two. If you, look at all, if you look at graphs without any odd holes, then the chromatic number is at most some function of the clique number. There are, that's the weak, well, one of the weaker of several conjectures by Jarfesh, and I want to talk about some of the others later. But let me talk about this, because we proved this one. So Alec, this is, this is all joint work with Alex Scott, except right at the end, which is, which is a... Uh, sorry, the apparatus is coming off. Okay. Um, I thought I'd show you the proof of this, because the proof is... I can actually more or less honestly do the proof. So let me uh, try. We're going to prove uh, that. Actually, we can do better. We can get 2 to the 2 to the omega, but I don't suppose anybody cares. Um, and the proof is a bit harder if you want 2 to the 2 to the omega. So let me stick with 2 to the 3. Um, OK, so here's a graph. It's got no odd holes, and we want to prove its chromatic numbers bounded by a function of clique number. We might as well we'll do induction on the clique number. So we'll assume it's true for graphs with smaller clique number. Is everybody clear so far what an odd hole is, what we're proving? So we're proving uh, this by induction on clique number. And uh, we'll assume every graph with smaller clique number than G has chromatic number at most n. And then we want to, it's enough to get prove that the chromatic number of G is at most some function of n. We're going to prove 48 n cubed. And uh, then if you uh, figure out the induction, you find you've proved what, you, what I said at the start, that we proved uh, this thing. Um, you might think what happens to the 48, but uh, you can hide it in the base of the induction. It goes away. Um, now, the nice thing about this proof is that there's nothing difficult in it. You know, I can do all the steps. There are all of them. This is an old problem, and uh, there are sort of things that you make, automatic things you do to this problem and similar problems that everybody knew for years. And we did them, and they worked. I don't understand that you do them in the right combination and suddenly they work. Well, sure, but uh, it's nothing very hard. So, by a leveling, I mean, pick a vertex, take its neighbors, take the people joined to them, people distance two, people distance three, and so on. And this, we can assume the graph is connected. So uh, you can classify everyone by distance from some vertex. This is L0, L1, L2. Um, if I can prove each of these sets, the subgraphs induced on these levels has bounded chromatic number, then the whole thing has bounded chromatic number because it's at most twice as much. I'll just use one set of colors for the odd levels, one set of colors for the even levels. I just double the number of colors. So it's enough to prove that one level, this level has... 24, chromatic number at most 24 n cubed, and that's, that's what we're going to prove now. We want to prove that if this is LK, chromatic number's at most 24 n cubed. Um, now it's a statement about a level, so we don't really care about the other levels. I mean, we could delete them. What would happen if we deleted them? If I deleted all this stuff, and we're just trying to prove that this graph has chromatic number bounded, well, then we've lost everything. Then we're back to just some graph with no odd hole and chromatic. You know, 
we've, we've wasted all this stuff and we have to prove something stronger than we had to prove originally. That's not the right thing to do. But let's just minimize this subject to it being a leveling. I, I want everybody here has a neighbor upstairs, everybody here has a neighbor up there, and so on, all the way back to the top. But make the top minimal subject to keeping that property. And I might as well make this connected. And if I'm proving the chromatic number of the subgraph is small, it's enough to prove the chromatic number of each component there is small. So I might as well prove this is connected. I might as well assume this is connected. Sorry, that's an assumption. This is what we want to prove. Okay, so far? Um, well, so what does it mean if I've made all these levels minimal? I, I wish I had a longer problem. <laughs> Picture is you run out of space before you run out of levels. Let me draw a few more levels. So here are some more. I might as well assume there are no levels below because I only care about this level. What does it mean that this level, Li, is, is minimal? It means everybody here is needed. Every vertex there is needed for someone in the next level down. If I, if I delete this vertex, then there's somebody here who won't have a parent anymore. And that's the <coughs> unique parent property, that for every vertex in a level i, there is a vertex in level i plus 1, such that v, v is the unique parent of u. So we can assume that just by making it minimal. Um, there's another thing we know, because if you look at two vertices here, each of them has a, has, is needed for someone, so each of them has a neighbor downwards, and they have neighbors downwards. You can get right down to the bottom, possibly. I'm not saying, I'm not saying there are no chords between these paths, but, but there is some path like this. Oops. There is some induced path like this. Uh, joining the two vertices, and otherwise strictly below. And there's also, you can go upwards. You know, they have parents. Go up until they join up. So you can also join them upwards. Now, we don't have any odd hole. And when I stick this path together with that path, it makes some kind of a hole. So therefore, it makes an even hole. So, and, the, and that means that the path below and the path above have the same length mod 2. And in particular, that means that all of these paths, it doesn't matter which path you choose on top, they all have the same length mod 2 because they all agree with the path on the bottom. And that's the parity property that uh, for any two vertices in a level, all the paths joining them above have the same length. Right? So, so we might as well assume we have the, let me see, what's something bad has happened. Uh, Interesting. Is that going to... Oh, yeah, that's better. Okay, look at that. It works. Um, so, it doesn't cost us anything to assume we've got these two extra properties. We're still proving the same conclusion, 24 incubed. We've just increased the number of hypotheses. So, can't hurt. It makes it look more complicated, but it surely made it easier because... Uh, got more hypotheses and we want the same conclusion. Now, um, let me tell you, so there's one not quite obvious idea, and that's a spine. So let me tell you about a spine. Uh, I guess I should use this picture. Now let me let's be extravagant, have yet another picture. So, Choose a neighbor of the top. He's needed for someone. He's needed for someone. He's needed for someone. He's needed for someone all the way down. And what is that? You get a path like this. What property does that path mean? Every vertex is needed for the next vertex down. Meaning nobody else, th there's nobody like this. Nobody, th this vertex has a unique parent, and it's the vertex in the path. So nobody attaches to the path downwards. So how can you attach to the path? You might attach like this. You might attach like that. 
You might attach like that. But you can't attach going downward. And any edge is either inside a level or going between two consecutive levels. So you know, if I'm looking at the vertices, if I call this path S, and the vertices attaching to S we'll call N of S, um, the vertices in N of S, they do, uh, well, six possible, I mean, three possible things. They can do this, or they can do that, or they can do that. But I also want to classify them as but even height and odd height. So we'll think of it as six different types. Not that it matters. So this is just what, what I just said. Now, um, so let's just fix a type. So let's just look at all the vertices of, say, this type, and delete everyone else. Let's just keep the people that attach at even levels by a slopey edge. So for instance, I'm running up. We'll keep people that just, we'll just keep the vertices in N of S that look like this. And look at all the, all the, the people you can get. So OK, let me say it again. Keep a type and look at the vertices in the bottom. So for every vertex in the bottom, just chase it upwards until the first time it has a neighbor in the spine. For every vertex upwards, chase it up until, for every vertex in the bottom, chase it upwards until the first time it has a neighbor in the spine. And uh, look at the type of the vertex you get. So let's look at the vertices. So the first vertex they hit are of this type. Is that type one? Uh, probably not. Yes, maybe it's type 1. So look at the vertices such that the first vertex they hit is of type 1. So maybe vertices like that. Look at all the vertices like this. And also look at all the vertices so the first vertex they hit is type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5, 6. That's, that's divided the bottom into six sets. And the bottom had big chromatic numbers, so one of these six sets has big chromatic numbers. So let's just choose one of them that's got big chromatic number. Um, in other words, I can assume all these vertices have a path which leads up the first time it hits the spine, it hits the spine at a vertex of the same type. Not necessarily type 1, but of some type. Always the same type. And I'm happy with types 1, 2, 3, 4. I don't like types 5 and 6 very much. Because, I mean, with, uh, say, type 1, I'll just keep all the vertices in all these paths. It's still a leveling. Everybody still has a parent in the next level up. If I, if I do this type, if I just keep the people like that and look at the, the people that attach in that way, so say you were looking at this picture now, if I just keep these vertices, that's not a leveling anymore because we don't know that these guys have neighbors upstairs now. They might have lost all their parents. We might have destroyed the leveling property if we just focus on that subgraph. That's annoying. We like the leveling property. But it doesn't really matter. If this happens, what you do is you take the spine and you move it up one notch. And then suddenly everybody's got a parent in the next level up instead. You just move all the vertices of the spine up one level. Right? So if you, if you end up in types 5 or 6, you can disguise it as, types, as type 1 or 2 just by shifting the spine one level. So we really only have to handle types 1, 2, 3, and 4. So that's, uh, I mean, that's the hardest bit of the proof, I think. Yeah, not quite. We're getting that. That was the idea. <laughs> um, so I've, I've included in the definition of a spine that Everyone attaches to it in the same way. So, sorry, this is a bit out of order, but uh, I hope it makes sense. Now, so where are we then? We divided the bottom into six sets, and we, we wanted to prove the chromatic number of the whole of the bottom was 24 n cubed. So if I could prove for each of the sets it's at most 4 n cubed, we'd be happy, because we have to multiply by 6. We need to prove that each of the sets has chromatic number at most 4 n cubed. Right, 
Here we are again. And now I have a special path down the spine. And everyone attaches to it. Everyone with a neighbor in it ha attaches to the, the next vertex up. But might also attach horizontally. We've got two kinds now. And uh, I've also got, they're also either all of them even or all of them odd levels. It's hard to draw that. Um, now, so now we have to get four in cubed. Let me tell you the parent rule. The parent rule says if you take an edge here, then these two vertices have the same parents. For any edge inside a level, both ends have the same parents. Um, let me show you why that's. I claim that follows. It's a theorem. That if, uh, if you've got all the hypotheses so far, then you have the parent rule. Because, I mean, suppose, let's have another level. Suppose here's an edge, and there's somebody adjacent to this that's not adjacent to that. I suppose they have different parents. Well, he's need, this vertex on the left is needed for someone. So he has a child. He's a ch he has a child that he's the unique parent of. So in particular, this vertex is not adjacent to that. And he has a child. You can get right down to the bottom. Um, so let's, what would happen? That means there is a path from here over to there. You go down to the bottom, across, and up again. That might not be induced, but make it induced. Shortcut if it has chords. So we get, a, we get a path like this. And the thing is, it doesn't go through any neighbors of that. It doesn't go through any neighbors of the vertex in a circle. Well, how do I know that? This could be an edge, but let's not worry about it. It's the case. Um, now, how can I, I want to complete that to a whole. I know. I can just go straight up and down again. And we already talked about that. All those paths have the same parity, because everyone attaches to the spine in the same way. You know, I go, up, I go directly upwards until I hit the spine, and then down again. If I'm in this case, if all my attachments to the spine look like that, then every path of this type is even. If all my attachments to the spine look like that, a triangle, then every attachment to all these paths are odd. But either they're all odd, for all vertices in all levels, or they're all even for all vertices in all levels. Anyway, they're all something. But I can also go along here and up and go up this way. And this is also, you know, it's, it's all the same something. That's the same something. It's either, that one's either odd or even, depending what the other one was, but it's the same. And yet we change the length by one mod two, and that's a contradiction. You can't, one of the two holes we made is going to be odd now. Um, okay. That's a, so the parent rule is quite a strong, strong statement. Um, I might as well throw it in as a hypothesis, because we can prove it's true. I mean, the list of hypotheses is getting longer, as they say, but it can't hurt. Now, so what good is the parent rule? Well, for instance, uh, by the way, notice it doesn't work right at the bottom here. It doesn't work absolutely in the bottom. It doesn't work at the next level up. Because you need to be able to go down, and then you need to be able to get back here without going through any neighbors of that vertex. If I try to make the same argument down in this level, oops, I go down and I try to get across. Well, I can arrange that vertex as non-adjacent to him, but when I go out, I might pick up neighbors. So it doesn't work in the second level up. But from the third level up, you can get the parent rule. Now, what use is the parent rule? Look at a level which has the parent rule. I claim it can't have a maximum clique. It can't have a clique of, size, of the same size as a maximum clique in G. Because everybody here has a parent, and they've all got the same parent. So this vertex would be adjacent to all of them. You get an even bigger clique. So inside any one level, you don't have a maximum clique. And that means you can color. By induction, you can color it. It actually tells you more. 
because you can't even have a three-edge path here. Because suppose you had a, an induced three-edge path. Again, all these vertices have the same parent. So follow this down to the bottom and back again. What length is that? It doesn't go through any neighbors of those two. What length is that? It has to be even, because you can complete it that way. You must not get an odd hole. But also, I can complete it with a three-edge path. So contradiction. You can't have a three-edge path inside a level. So that's even stronger. So we do, don't even really need this in fact by induction that we can color a level. We can color a level because it doesn't have a three-edge path. It's a co-graph. Do you know about co-graphs? A co -graphs are a graph that doesn't have an induced subgraph, which is a three-edge path, is a co-graph. The definition is going to come on the screen eventually. But there are lots of nice things about co-graphs. And in particular, they're perfect. The chromatic number equals the clique number. So um, anyway, we need to prove this fact. I've thrown some of the hypotheses away now, but I'm holding on to the parent rule hypothesis. Notice the spine is gone. I don't need the spine anymore. Now, there's a difference between this one and that one. Um, oops. OK. So this is what we're currently proving. I want to say we might as well prove that. Um, because, <laughs> all right, yet again. We're trying to prove that LK has small chromatic number. I can color LK minus 2. I know I can color it. In I mean, I'm, we could use this co-graph fact, but I'm not going to. Um, we can color this with n colors. Here we know the chromatic numbers at most n, because we've got the parent rule there. And uh, so therefore, there's no maximum clique there. We can apply induction. Um, so break it in, you can break it into a small number of stable sets, just n stable sets. Look at the children of each stable set. I claim the children of any one stable set you could color. Well, at least if I knew this fact, uh, yeah, all right. So look at the grandchildren of any stable set. If I could prove that this is 4n square colorable, you know, everybody at the bottom is the grandchild of one of these n stable sets. So then I would have proved that the bottom is 4n cubed colorable. If each of the sets of descendants is 4n squared colorable, and there's n, n sets of descendants, that's all we would need. So that's the difference between this statement and that one. I'm assuming LK minus 2 is stable, which I can. Just focus on one of these, throw all the, throw all the others away, look at the descendants of it, and prove that that's stable. Right? So where are we now? Um, so this one is stable. And we want to prove this is 4n square colorable. Well, what's the chromatic number of this one? I mean, we don't really know. Everybody's up, everybody has a parent, but uh, we don't really know what its chromatic number is. It might be big, it might be small. We can assume this one's big, or else we're done. We know this one is one colorable, it's stable. But we don't know what the one in the middle is. And it might be big or it might be small. But either you get a big gap this way, or you get a big gap that way. I mean, um, suppose I could prove this is 2n colorable. Suppose I could prove this level is 2n colorable. Then I could break it into 2n stable sets, look at the children of each one. Each of them would be 2n colorable by the same argument. And then I would have 4n square colored the bottom. So that's the difference between this one and that one. Notice uh, here I'm assuming the, not two levels back is stable, but one level back is stable. So, so again, suppose you could prove that when this is stable, that's 2n colorable. Then we apply it twice. We start here, we say this is 2n colorable, and then for each, each stable set, we take, say its children are 2n colorable, and that gives us a 4n square coloring of the bottom. 
So the, the point is you've got three layers. At some stage, the chromatic number has to go up fast, either between first and second or between second and third. One or the other, it's got to go up fast. So look at the pair where it goes up fast. All right, so now we're not there. We're here. This is stable. And now we're committed to proving that this is 2n colorable. Um, what can we do now? What properties can we use now? I mean, we've, we've done, you know, we've hit this as hard as we can. All the edges are gone. We had the parent rule, and now there aren't even any edges to apply the parent rule to. We've, we can color it, because trivially, all, everything we're getting by induction on these previous levels, it seems to have done the most it can for us. Well, now, here's one more thing you can do. For any two vertices here, there is a path above the joining them, and there's a path below joining them. And those two paths are either both even or both odd. So you've got, you get even pairs and odd pairs there. And, uh, and the thing is, if, if some path joining these is even, then every path at the bottom joining them is even. And there is such a path. And that means every path on top joining them is even. So either for every two vertices, either every path joining them is even, or every path joining them is odd. So it's a, it's a, you know, a well-defined distinction between even and odd. You get two kinds of edges here. Now, here's the, the place where fate was kind to us. You look at the, look at the graph of odd pairs. So the, there's odd pairs and even pairs there. The odd pairs make a graph. Look at the graph. What graph is it? It's a co-graph. So again, a co-graph means a graph with no induced subgraph, which is a 3-edge path. Um, because what would it mean if there was a three-edge path here? It means you've got four vertices so that this is an odd pair, and that's an odd pair, and that's an odd pair, and the other three are even pairs. Why can't that happen? Well, each of these has a parent. And uh, so just trace them all upwards and encourage them to meet. So. If you can choose three, three parents covering all four of them, do so. If you can find two parents covering all four of them, that's even better. So first of all, choose a, a minimal set here covering all four, and then choose a minimal set there covering all of them, and so on, and go all the way back up. And let's, let's go, now you have to go through cases. Here I'm not going to do the argument. But, but uh, I mean, I could do a random case. No, I better not. Um, but. I mean, they all have to meet sometime, because they'll meet at the top if they don't meet sooner. And you look at where do they meet. Well, what we actually did was we look and see when do these two middle paths first meet. That's an odd pair, so they can't meet like that. That would be an even path. They have to first meet like that, with the horizontal edge. And now, what does this do? Well, could it just overshoot? Could it just miss them? Uh, well, if it does, then, you know, the, the, there's a parent rule here, so they've got a common parent. If, if you miss them, go up to the top and send this up to the top and get them joined somehow. Then I've got a path here and a path there, same length. But that's impossible because that's an odd pair and that's an even pair. So you can't miss them. You've got to, somewhere on the way up, you're going to have to have edges out somehow. And now you've got cases. The same is true on this side. And you can worry about, you know, is there an edge between this and that? And do these come out of the same height? Or are they slightly skewed? And there's some cases to do, but it all works. You just, you know, 
It's all straightforward. Let me, let's suppose we believe that. So it's a co-graph. Why is it good that it's a co-graph? Well, there's a nice theorem about co-graphs. Okay, that's, that's the stuff I just said. Right? So, now it's an, so we can assume it's a co-graph. We might as well assume it's a co-graph. And from now on, the graph of jumps here. Mm. From now on, I don't need the previous levels. And the co-graph, it, it's, it's the, I mean, I can see whether a pair is odd or even by looking at paths below. I mean, I proved it's a co-graph by looking at the paths above. But if I want to use the fact that there's a co-graph, I'm going to use the paths below. So I'll just look at these two consecutive levels and use the fact that this graph of jumps is a co-graph. Now, there's a nice fact about co-graphs. Where did it go? Uh, no, which I haven't written down. But there's a nice fact about co-graphs that if you have a co- Here's how you build co-graphs. I mean, you take two co-graphs and take their disjoint union. That's one way to build a bigger co-graph and two smaller co-graphs. Another way is take two gro take two gra whoops take two <laughs> two co-graphs you've already built take the disjoint union but then make everybody here adjacent to everybody there so it's it's the disjoint union in the complement and there's a theorem that you can build every co-graph that way starting from one vertex graph in other words you can partition this into two sets so that either all these par there's no edges of the co-graph from left to right or all edges are present from left to right. So either every left-right pair is even, or every left-right pair is odd. And that allows us to do something by induction. It allows us to prove, well, what do we want to prove? We want to prove the bottom is 2n colorable. Actually, I'm going to prove the bottom is 2 colorable. But 2 colorable doing something else, not, not as a graph coloring, but as a hypergraph coloring. I'm going to prove you can 2 color the bottom so that every maximum clique meets both colors. Every maximum clique meets both colors. So every omega clique in the bottom meets both left and right. If that were true, then you just look at the left-hand side. There aren't any omega cliques contained inside of it, so by induction, you can n-color it. And same for the right. You can n-color that, and then that's 2 n colored the whole bottom. So if I can get this 2 coloring, uh, then, then we've won. And let's prove the two coloring exists by induction using the decomposition of the co-graph. From now on, it's just a statement about these two levels. I don't need any of the previous levels. Well, let's see. I mean, let's just do a case. Suppose, which case is easier? Uh, let's say, I mean, in both cases are almost exactly the same. Say all these pairs are, I don't know, even. Uh, let's do odd. I don't know which is better. Um, so then uh, and we'll prove by induction that we can two-color the cliques at the bottom. Well, all these pairs are odd, so that means nobody has neighbors both left and right. Everybody has neighbors upstairs, but nobody has neighbors both left and right, because that would be an even pass from left to right. So there are people which attach to the left, and there are people that attach to the right. But nobody attaches both ways. Now, you might think inductively we'll color this and color that, but I mean, and that would fi be fine if we were doing graph coloring, but we're not. We're doing, we're coloring the, well, actually, it wouldn't be fine if we were doing graph coloring either, would it? But anyway, we're doing hypergraph coloring. We have to worry about the cliques that meet both left and right. I mean, inductively, I can color the cliques contained in here, and I can color the cliques contained in there, but how do I color the cliques that meet both left and right? Well, you color the left side white and you color the right side black. That's two colored them, right? Except now you've used the vertices at the bottom for two different things. You, get, you assign colors here to color the cliques on the left. And we also assign colors here to color the cliques that were split between left and right. No fair. I mean, I've got to, I've got to produce one coloring. So we're not happy if there's a, an omega clique like this that intersects an omega clique like that. If there's a vertex that's being used, a dual-purpose ver vertex, it's needed for coloring a clique 
completely on the left, and it's needed for coloring a clique that's split between left and right. Then we're not happy. But that doesn't happen. There's no such pair of cliques. And the argument is, I can do it. Let's see. So suppose, suppose there's a, there is a, then in particular there's a vertex here with neighbors in that. There is a vertex with neighbors there. Now, he's not joined to everything because there was already a maximum clique. So he has some non-neighbors as well. This set is non-empty. Look at all the people up top that have neighbors there. And look at the one, uh, look at any one of them. And this guy has a parent. Now, I can't go down, across, across, up, because that would be a four-edge path, and all paths from left to right are odd. So what's wrong with this four-edge path going down, across, across, up? Must not be induced somewhere. How could it not be induced? This is not joined to that. This is not joined to that. This is not joined to this. This is not joined to this or this. It must be that this vertex is joined to that vertex. And that's true for every vertex here. So all these people with neighbors in that set, they're complete to this set. All the people with neighbors in that set are complete to this set. Uh, well, that means, so pick one of them. He can't be complete to that set as well, or else he'd be complete to the whole maximum clique. You'd have an even bigger clique. So let me, let me expand this a bit so we can see what we're doing. Choose a vertex here that's joined to as much of this as possible. It's not joined to all of it, there's somebody else. Now choose somebody else here that's joined to the other one. He's not joined to all of this, because we already chose someone that's joined to as much of this as possible. So he's got a non-neighbor over there. So I've got a three-edge path between them. Can I have a three-edge path between them? No, because I've also got an, a two-edge path between them. You can't have an odd pair between them and an even pair between them, because all paths between them have the same parity. And that's the proof. That's it. Right? And the case when all the paths between left and right are even, it's the same. It's almost exactly the same. I copy and pasted the proof from one to the other. So it really is the same. Um, so that's, that's the proof of the odd holes thing. Uh, I wanted to show you another, a few other odd, maybe just one. Um, this is a conference on decomposition, so I thought I'd show you a decomposition result. That's, um, so you know what a tree decomposition is. Tree, yeah, everybody knows a tree decomposition. But it's something satisfying this. You've got, a, you've got a tree, and for every vertex of the tree, you've got a subset of the vertices of your graph, and satisfying these axioms. The important thing is the betweenness condition. That when you have three vertices of the tree in order on some path, then any vertex in the first bag and the third bag also belongs to the second bag. And every edge has both ends inside one of the bags. This is a tree decomposition. So normally, this comes up when you're talking about tree width and you care about the size of the bags. But I wanted to think about something different. I wanted to look at the chromatic number. So look at a bag and look at the subgraph induced on it and look at its chromatic number. What can you say about the chromatic number so when you get a, a tree decomposition where all the bags have bounded chromatic number, they can be big bags if they want, but they have bounded chromatic number. And I don't know anything about this. I mean, maybe it's been thought about it before, but I didn't find anything. Uh, so let's call that tree chi, just for the sake of a name. Tree chi of a graph is the smallest k such that there's a tree decomposition where the bags have chromatic number at most k. Um, I mean, you could also define, you know, path width, and there's, there's all this stuff about path width and tree width and what the difference is, and there are graphs with small tree width and big path width. For instance, big binary trees have small tree width and big path width. Uh, but you can define path chi. First question is, is tree chi equal to path chi for every graph? Can't possibly be true. Please give me a counterexample. <laughs> Second question, is this some function, is tree chi bound, rather, is, is path chi bounded above by some function of tree chi? 
If tree chi is small, if tree chi is two, is path chi bounded? I also can't prove that. So I'm really far from knowing anything about these parameters. They might always be equal. I can't even prove there's any connection between them. I mean, obviously path width and tree width are different, but with path chi, you know, here's my tree, you might think of just squashing, squashing the levels and thinking of it as a path. Take, replace all these, the bags for all these vertices on one level by one big bag. And if only the chromatic number didn't go up, that would be fine. It would still be a path decomposition. And still, and these are nearly disjoint. You know, they're on different branches. So if only they were really disjoint, you could take the disjoint and, uh, without increasing your chromatic number. But uh, it's not exactly true. But there's some element of truth in it. So, I mean, this is a bit truer than the analogous thing for path width and tree width. I mean, it might conceivably be true, but I really don't believe it. Um, what could, let me just, I think have got a couple of minutes. Let me, let me give you an example. And it's not too easy to think of a graph with big chromatic number and small tree chromatic number. Let me show you a nice one. So take a graph, G, uh, with huge chromatic number, right. a million. That's huge, right? Um, and order its vertices, V1, V2, up to Vn. Now I want to look at the direct, sort of directed line graph. So we've, we've got edges here. I want, I want to make the graph H, where the vertices of H are the edges of G, and I'll say that UV, so VI, VJ is adjacent to VK, VL in H if, you know, I is less than J, K is less than L, and J equals K. So it's a sort of directed line graph. I, I want to say this edge is adjacent to that edge. So two edges are adjacent if the right end of one equals the left end of the other. Some graph. Sort of, if you, think, if you think of directing all the edges from left to right, then this is the directed line graph. Um, what happens to its chromatic number? Well, let me prove the chromatic number of H is at most, it's at least, which is, it's, it's something like log, log of the chromatic number you started with. So let's see, what would the... The, it's at least the log of the chromatic number you started with. And in fact, it's at most the log of the chromatic number you started with plus half log log of the chromatic number you started with plus a constant, a very small constant, like something involving pi that I've forgotten, but it's something, it's some very small constant. It's, I mean, less than one, I think. Um, so we've really got good control over chi of H. I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm just saying that the, the line graph has still got big chromatic number is all I need here. But in fact, it's a nice fact that you, you know the chromatic number exactly, almost exactly, without even knowing what, in what order you put the vertices in or what the graph is. You can figure out the chromatic number almost exactly. It's a log of what you started with. Um, Anyway, so look at this thing. It's got bounded chromatic number. It's got big chromatic number. I claim it's got path chi 2. Because how can I give you a, a path decomposition where all the bags have bounded chromatic number? Well, just order the vertices. And the vertices are ordered. For each vertex, Look at the edges that either land at it or jump over it. That's a set of vertices in H. So look at the edges that either land at it or jump over it. That's a set of vertices of H. And as you go along, as the vertices go along, this is some set of subsets of my graph. Of vertex. It's a path decomposition because if, say, an edge 
jumps over that vertex and an edge jumps over that vertex and it also jumps over every, everybody in between. So if you're in this bag and in that bag, then you're in all the bags in between. It's a party composition. Um, and the set of edges that jump over this is two colorable because the only edges I'm going to get within this set are between edges that land here and edges that leave there. I mean, edges that jump clean over are not going to be adjacent to anybody else that lands at or jumps over this. The only people, the only edges you get among, with, with both ends in this bag, are between this edge and that edge. And so, so that's too colorable, right? So all these bags are too colorable. And that's, so the thing's got bounded path, it's got uh, path chi 2, and it has huge chromatic numbers. So at least such graphs exist. It does say, well, maybe it would be better if they didn't exist, because I'm going to prove now, I'm going to prove, uh, I'll show you what I'm going to prove. There's a conjecture of Jarfash, another conjecture of Jarfash. You know, the first one we were looking at was for graphs that don't have a lo uh, an odd hole. There's another conjecture of Jarfash about graphs that don't have a long hole, a hole of length at least to uh, L. If, so I don't care if it's odd or even, but if you don't have a long hole, then the chromatic number is bounded by a function of L and omega. And that's not even proved for triangle-free graphs. So let's think about it for triangle-free graphs. If, uh, if you're triangle-free and you've got no hole of length L, then it would be nice if you could prove the chromatic number is bounded by a function of L. Um, it's open. I haven't proved it. But what I can prove is this, that if it's triangle-free, no hole of length, so, then it's tree chi is at most L. So if only there weren't any graphs with small tree chi and big chi, that would be wonderful, right? <laughs> but, uh, but they exist. But anyway, it seems to me, I don't know if this is interesting or not, but I, I sort of like, like I'm in, interested in tree chi. I would like to, I would like to understand it better, and this seems, this seems something non-trivial. The proof is sort of pleasant as well. Let me show you the proof. So, you know, if, if you take a connected graph, you can choose a spanning tree. And uh, you can choose a breadth first tree. You, could, you know, start with the root. You can choose a breadth first tree where you're just going, classic, going to the closest people first. You can choose a depth first tree. For a depth first tree, If I'm building a depth first tree, I, I start from my root, I choose a child of it, I choose a child of that, choose it. And while I can keep on choosing children, I do. And if I have to back up, I back up as little as possible and then start choosing children again. And then maybe I have to back up and I start choosing children again. And sometimes I have to back up all the way down to here and I start choosing children. But that's a uh, depth first tree. And it has the nice property that, that it gives a spanning tree. And for every non-tree edge, both its ends are in the same path going back to the root. If it went between two different branches, then look at whichever one you did first. Why didn't you continue in that direction? Why did you back down and go up this way? You could have gone there. And so depth first trees have this nice property that every non-tree edge, its both ends are sort of in a path to the root. But I want to, I want to avoid that property. I mean, breadth-first trees have the, adv the other advantage that for every path out from the root, it's an induced path. So I would like to do both at once. That seems, they seem incompatible. <laughs> now, uh, but the, the, it's almost possible. So what you do is, you do build a depth-first tree subject to the condition that the paths coming out from the root are induced. Build a depth-first tree subject to the condition that the paths, all the paths coming from the root are induced. So you choose a child, choose a child, choose a child. As long as this is all induced, fine. And now we can't do it anymore, so back up and go somewhere else. As long as this path is induced, that's fine. And uh, now, I claim you, following, you can, I mean, it's an algorithm, you can grow something. Do you get a spanning tree? Might it be that you grow some tree, but there are vertices you didn't get to at all? Um, well, 
This vertex would have a neighbor somewhere. Why didn't I add that edge when I was looking at that vertex? Because the, the path it gives me is not induced, but that means it's got an earlier neighbor on this path. So why didn't I add that edge when I was doing this vertex? Because that path is not induced. I mean, it has to, be, it has to fit somewhere. So you can certainly grow some spanning tree like this. And it's called an, I'm calling it an uncle tree. Because uh, it's, it's a planar tree, right? You, you've drawn in the tree, and think of every time you grow, you grow on the left. And that gives you a drawing, an embedding of the tree in the plane. And where are the non-tree edges? Well, there are no edges sort of like this. Because if there was an edge like that, why didn't I add this edge when I was doing that vertex? This would have been an induced path. Well, maybe it wouldn't, because maybe there was an edge here. But why didn't I add that edge when I was doing this vertex? Because it must have a lower end. I mean, it's almost a contradiction, right? If the, as soon as there's a non-tree edge, you look at the, the lowest neighbor of that and ask, why didn't I add it when I was doing that vertex? It must be that the, you did add it. It must be that the non-tree edges go to people that are adjacent to the path via a tree edge. All the non-tree edges, the left end is adjacent to the path by a tree edge. And that's what I mean by an uncle tree. That's, so it's a spanning tree, it's a planar tree. I meant to say it's a planar tree. And for every non-tree edge, the left end is an uncle of the right end. And there's a theorem. Every kinetic graph has an uncle tree. Yeah, it's got to be good for something. Isn't that nice? I mean, depth-first trees and breadth-first trees are useful for all kinds of stuff. Can't we use uncle trees for anything? I mean, they're different. Anyway, yes, you can. You can use it for one thing. You can use it to prove this theorem. Uh, what you do is you take an uncle tree, and it's actually the right tree for the tree decomposition. What you do is, for each vertex, you look at the, look at the few preceding vertices, the L preceding in the path down to the root, and you look at everybody on the left adjacent to that. And you take his children as well. Uh, so it's there. For, for each vertex, T, you look at the, the L preceding vertices in the tree. You look at all the children of T. You look at all the people adjacent to the L preceding vertices in the graph, not just in the tree. And that's some set of vertices. And it turns out you can prove it's a tree decomposition. And it's got bounded chi. Why has it got bounded chi? Because Everybody here is adjacent to one of these L vertices. And if you look at the, vertice, the people adjacent to any one vertex, it's a stable set, triangle free. So, so that's, you know, the, you have to check it's a tree decomposition. Let me not, but you can imagine what happens. That, that if, I mean, use the fact there's no long hole. If it fails to be a tree decomposition, then somebody somewhere is adjacent above this path and it's adjacent below that path, but it missed all the path. That's the kind of thing that happens. Um, so that was neat. Um, there are lots of other Sharfash conjectures, and they all seem to be crumbling slowly. I hope. I don't know. There were, there were, we see there, there are so good, prominent Sharfash conjectures. Like if you don't have a an odd hole of length L, then you're bound to chromatic number. Um, and Alex Scott and I have made some progress in the last couple of weeks. That we seem to be able to prove exactly the, the stuff you don't want to prove. We can fill all the gaps between the Sharfish conjectures. <laughs> but but it, it, you can't prove much more without proving something useful, I think. I mean, we, uh, I won't tell you exactly what we can prove, but, it's, but it's, it seems to be making progress. Anyway, OK, let me stop there. Thanks. So for this last theorem, uh, the only place you use triangle free is the last moment where yes, the neighbors. Yeah. So uh, in general, there's a treaty composition where not bounded chromatic number, but each set has bounded domination number. And so if it's triangle free, that means bounded chromatic number. But is that is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. That's it was just the last step. Tri we use triangle free there. Has anybody seen that before, this chromatic number, tree chromatic number? Do you know anything about it? Yeah, I think that when all bags have bounded domination number, this was used in some cups and rubber game. If I remember where this was in Brazil. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you can actually recover it, I think it'll be useful. Yeah, because if you have a the and it's a complete elimination, where the cops, they, they can sit there, keep this, and attack yeah. branches. So one determination, I'm sure, um, something like seven years ago, this had popped up in this cup and brought the game on for some of this. Uh, uh, but then I don't know what had been done. Uh, so. Any further questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again.